Julia. Uh, I'm Chandler Rowe. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Informatics and Computing and Cyber Systems at Northern Arizona University. And I'm also a PACVET grant recipient studying the newly emerging parasite in the United States. But today I'm here to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Claudia Ruckert. Dr. Ruckert's main research interest is virus vector interactions. She is currently establishing a research program focusing on mosquito antiviral response with the aim of identifying targets for arbovirus transmission control. Further projects focus on mosquito biology, improving methodology to study Culex mosquitoes and molecular biology of viruses that are transmitted by arthropod vectors. The Rukert Lab is also involved in a collaborative NSF EPSCOR project to define tick and tick-borne disease distribution in the Western United States. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Claudia Rukert. Thank you, Shanda. All right, yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Thank you, uh, Celia and the other organizers for inviting me to give this seminar. Um, as Chandler mentioned, we're kind of trying to build capacity um, to study Culex antiviral responses, or some of the work we do might benefit other research related to Culex mosquitoes as well. And I'll get into a little bit more detail uh, why that's important and why we have a lack of capacity currently. I yeah, so I started my lab two years ago. A lot of our projects are sort of in their infancy. So this will be a bit more of like an overview of what we do and what we're trying to achieve. It's not necessarily one of those um, super polished beginning to end beautiful story kind of talks. It's more um, to show you what we've been working on and how that might fit with someone else's research and what they might benefit from that we're doing potentially. So I cut the introduction relatively short, assuming that a lot of people are um, familiar with mosquitoes and mosquitoes as vectors, but briefly, in, in case you're working on other vectors or um, need a refresher, um, there's three major genera of mosquitoes that are vectors of pathogens, um, Anopheles mosquitoes, Culex mosquitoes, and Aedes mosquitoes. I'm not saying the others do not transmit any diseases, but these are sort of the major groups. Um, Anopheles are mainly known as vectors of malaria, so plasmodium parasites. Uh, Culex mosquitoes transmit both arboviruses as well as parasites, including plasmodium uh, as avian malaria and filarial parasites. And then Aedes aegypti are mainly vectors of arboviruses. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Culex and Aedes in the next slide. So the major vector species, as you might know, are Aedes aegypti, Aedes alpopictus for um, tropical and subtropical viruses such as dengue virus, Zika virus, chikungunya, and many others. And in more temperate regions, we might have Culex pipiens mosquitoes and Culex tarsalis mosquitoes, which transmit, for example, West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, and in Europe also Yasutu virus. Um, these mosquitoes are present in cooler temperate regions. And then Culex pipiens quinque fasciatus are the southern house mosquito. Um, they transmit the same viruses as Culex pipiens and tarsalis, but in warmer, temperate, tropical, and subtropical regions. And then there's a lot of other vector species that I will not mention at all today, such as tri Culex tritania rhynchus, which transmits Japanese encephalitis virus, or Aedes triceriatus, which transmits, transmits lacrosse encephalitis virus. Um, so Culex mosquitoes are actually really widespread across the globe. Here on the left, you can see um, in blue Culex pipiens, and then in yellow Culex quinca fasciatus. And then in green, you see kind of the, the hybrid regions of those two. And uh, they're really spread from, through most of the continents and into pretty high northern regions. And then on the right, you can see Aedes aegypti, which is more of a tropical mosquito. And you have uh, regions where it's currently sort of invading, such as California or Southern Europe. And then Aedes albopictus has a similar distribution to Aedes aegypti, but goes further into northern region because it is more cold tolerant. So despite the fact that Culex mosquitoes are so widespread and they transmit uh, multiple different arboviruses, probably not even less arboviruses than Aedes aegypti, but they're significantly less studied in comparison. So this is just a graph that I pulled from PubMed, where you look at publications by year when I searched for Culex mosquito, Aedes mosquito, or Anopheles mosquito. And you can kind of see in the 
40s and 50s, it's very similar. And then anopolis in 80s kind of take off with more and more publications focused on them and on pathogens transmitted by them compared to uh, Culex mosquitoes. So when you get to here 2016, where you have a huge spike in um, Aedes aegypti papers or 80s papers, that's the Zika virus outbreak. Um, and QX are kind of sort of left behind in how much people work on them and work with them. It's a little biased here because this, these publications probably also include papers that really only focus on the mammalian side of the pathogen and they mention the mosquitoes in the abstract, but it gives you a general idea of how much more uh, well studied Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, for example, are. So one of the reasons why I think this is the case is the transmission cycle of disease, uh, viruses transmitted by Culex mosquitoes. So this is, for example, the transmission cycle of West Nile virus. And you can see in the middle, this enzootic cycle of um, the virus going between a mosquito vector, in this case, Culex mosquitoes, and a bird amplifier host. So this is the natural cycle for West Nile virus. And then humans or other large animals, such as horses, are really just dead end hosts that get infected incidentally. Uh, they're not, we do not play a role in maintaining the virus. As opposed to Aedes aegypti, so if you're familiar with the way um, Aedes mosquitoes are transmitting arboviruses, it really goes from human to mosquito, human to mosquito, and that's why when you have an outbreak of something like Zika virus, you get huge numbers, huge case numbers, and it kind of sweeps through um, areas quite quickly. Uh, as opposed to West Nile, which is kind of always there, but you don't get as many cases per year because it's only these incidental infections of uh, humans that cause disease. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. The other reasons why I think Culex mosquitoes are understudied is more of a technical one, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So briefly, I also wanted to introduce the concept of vector confidence, even though I imagine a lot of you might be familiar with it. Um, but I wanted to highlight that transmission of arboviruses is a complicated process where a lot of things happen inside the mosquito or, the, or any other vector. So when a mosquito takes a blood meal, the virus enters the midgut with the blood meal. It has to then infect the midgut epithelium, re replicate in the midgut epithelium, it then has to pass this uh, basal laminar structure to get into the hemolymph and cause a systemic infection in the mosquito, and then replicate in various mosquito tissues to high numbers um, to be able to infect the salivary gland later on. And then from the salivary gland um, with a subsequent blood meal, it can be transmitted with the saliva to a new host. So the reason why I'm highlighting this is that it's not a sort of passive mechanistic process, there's lots of active interaction between the mosquito and the virus happening. And um, one of the concepts that we're interested, is, interested in is how these cellular virus mosquito interactions actually uh, determine vector competence because this, any changes in vector competence or differences in vector competence can result in sort of a host or vector switching event and um, can be associated with the emergence of a new virus as a global pathogen. Um, Emergence of a new virus as a global pathogen can also just be simply through introduction of a new mosquito to a new area or a new virus to a new area. But often there's some amount of adaptation to a, to a new vector, for example. So we are really interested in these cellular virus mosquito interactions. I'm actually not sure if you could see my mouse, so let me just make sure I have the pointer on. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, we will focus on the cellular virus mosquito interactions in Culex vectors. And um, we sort of have three um, aims in, as part of this uh, project. So the first one would be to generate new in vivo and in vitro tools to work with Culex mosquitoes and mosquito cells. The second one is to study specific antiviral responses that we know from other mosquitoes. Uh, things that people have studied in Aedes aegypti that we would like to look a bit more into uh, using Culex um, mosquitoes and cells. And then the third one is more of an unbiased approach where we're interested in identifying novel proviral, antiviral, or viral tolerance genes in Culex quinquefasciatus mosquitoes using a high throughput screening system. So I'll first talk about this um, first kind of general aim of 
um, developing new in vitro and in vivo tools. So I have a, an undergraduate researcher and a PhD student working on the in vivo side of things, and then the same a PhD student undergraduate researcher on the in vitro side of things. And um, the four sort of main objectives we have are on the in vitro side to establish a cryopreservation strategy for mosquito, Culex mosquito colonies. So this is a small um, NIH funded project and I will go into why we need these cryopreservation strategies in the next slide. Um, the second part is to generate transgenic Culex mosquito lines. So we haven't really started working on this, but if you're familiar with the literature, there have been a few new strategies of how to get transgenic Culex mosquitoes, um, both through embryonic injection and um, what's called remote control, a technique developed by, the, by Jason Raskin's lab. So these are, we would like to knock out very specific proteins um, that we might think are involved in antiviral responses, as well as uh, potentially develop like reporter mosquitoes that become, that fluorescen, fluoresce when they become infected. Um, but we haven't really started on this one yet. And then on the in vitro side of things, one of the main issues we currently have is that we only have one Culex quinquefasciato cell line. And it's very, um, it's kind of difficult to work with. It grows very slowly. It, um, it's very finicky. If, if you leave it a little long or split it too soon, it kind of doesn't want to grow. Um, it's also very hard to infect uh, with various arboviruses. So we would like to develop a new QX quinta fasciatus mosquito cell line. And I've started working on that. And then um, finally using those, the cell line that we currently have, which are called HSU cells, we would like to single cell sort these cells and to create a cell line that's monoclonal and that has a homogeneous genetic background. So we can use it for things like knockout and knock in studies. Um, and then we would screen our clonal cell lines that we can get uh, for high transfection efficiency and high arbovirus susceptibility. So we have a slight, hopefully a slightly better system to work with in the future. So I'll start talking about the cryopreservation of Culex mosquito embryos. So we started this project last year, but due to the pandemic, our progress has been kind of slow. The main aim is that um, when you look at the way that mosquito eggs are laid, Anopheles lay their eggs on the surface of water as individual eggs, and they kind of just float there with these little floaty devices, I'm going to call them. Um, but you have to continuously maintain them. You cannot desiccate these eggs or store them in any way. Aedes mosquito eggs are laid on the wet surface, so in the lab it could be a wet coffee filter or a wet paper towel. You then can remove that paper towel, dry it out, the eggs desiccate, and they can be stored for multiple months. Uh, so this really enables you to um, have a mosquito line, 80s line, um, grow it up, make a few egg papers, and then not worry about it for three to four months. And QX are uh, more similar to Anopheles in that they lay their eggs on the surface of water, but they lay them at these rafts um, in a tight formation. And you can kind of see that here um, as the QX quinquefasciatus mosquito is ovipositing, um, it lays this like complete egg raft on the surface of the water and it just kind of floats there. Um, so they also cannot be desiccated and or stored, and they have to be continuously maintained. It's also hard because if you mess up the egg, the rats in any way, it can um, result in a loss of um, hatching as well. So the reason why we want to establish methods for cryopreservation of these cubic eggs is that if we want to make transgenic mosquito lines, and say we want to knock out two or three different genes, we suddenly we have two or three extra mosquito colonists that we have to maintain and uh, we cannot ever stop them. So the more you work with the mosquitoes, then the more colonies you might accumulate and it becomes a little bit um, unreasonable to handle. Not to mention that um, by just growing the mosquitoes continuously, you could get revertions or um, other changes to the mosquitoes. So in theory, it'd be nice if we could make a transgenic line uh, get a good number of mosquitoes and eggs and then freeze them down and store them in some sort of biobank for uh, mosquito eggs. And people have tried this with Anopheles using larvae and eggs as well, um, but I don't think there's any hugely successful strategy yet um, to do this. So the overall principle of the protocol is that we would take these egg rafts, 
separate the eggs with a fine paintbrush and transfer them to a cell strainer. So the cell strainer is just like a little sort of filter surface that we can put the eggs onto to dip them into different solutions for the treatment. Um, and so we've, we've managed this part just fine uh, without destroying the eggs or causing any damage. Um, the next step is that we have to remove the chorion because if the embryo, the egg has a chorion around it, nothing's going to get into the embryo to help protect it from the freezing. Um, so our current choice for that is 10% sodium hypochlorite for eight minutes. We tried a few different concentrations. Most people use uh, bleach. I mean, sodium hypochlorite is bleach um, for this process. And um, we've optimized it for dechlorination while still maintaining embryo survival. So, we're, so I'm actually quite happy by the fact that we can separate out these egg rafts, put them on a cell strainer, put them in a bleach solution, and then put them back into water and they survive. Um, the next step that we're currently working out is uh, dehydration. So some people uh, in the past have done this with isopropanol, but we've noticed that this is too harsh for our eggs. Um, and it's also, according to the literature, too harsh, too harsh for an Ockley's eggs. So we are just doing air drying. We're just letting the, the eggs air dry until they shrink. And this is supposed to move any excess water in the embryo that might potentially become like a crystal during freezing. And once the eggs are dry, um, you then al can allow a cryoprotectant to get into the embryos to protect them during the freezing process. So this is kind of the step we're currently working on, testing different cryoprotectants. Most people use ethylene glycol um, as a penetrating cryoprotectant, so it gets into the embryos to protect them. And then it, they usually also use a non-penetrating cryoprotectant that kind of coats the outside of the embryo to, again, protect it from the uh, harsh freezing process. And then we would snap freeze them and rapidly thaw them later in preheated FBS and measure survival and fecundity. So that's kind of our process and we're in the middle. Um, I apologize for not having any nice data graphs or anything for that. That's just because we've had a few different students working on it over time and they haven't collected you know, bar graph data yet. Um, but what we're hoping for is about 30% survival at the end. I think that would give us enough um, to revive a colony um, after a freezing process. And so the next step would be the, uh, the in vitro tools. Um, as I mentioned before, we're doing uh, single cell sorting of uh, Culex cunga fasciatus HSU cells. Uh, we've so far sorted um, HSU cells twice into individual wells of a 96 well plate. Uh, following a previously established protocol by uh, Fredericks et al. They did it in 80 citrified cells. Um, we then kind of pray to the science gods that our, some of our cells survive and actually grow. This might take multiple, multiple weeks because these cells are so slow growing that um, getting an individual cell into even just a little cluster of cells might take, you know, three or four weeks. So we're kind of patiently waiting right now, changing them in the media once a week and giving them sort of a high, high FBS media to try and uh, get them to grow. And then the second part is the generation of the new cell lines from QX fasciatus embryos. So we so far followed previous protocols to sterilize eggs and homogenize embryos using like a pestle. We centrifuge the, the cell mixture then down at a low speed to remove any sort of excess de debris, although you almost always get a little bit of um, egg shells or anything that stays in the media initially. And then we transfer them into three different types of media that might work for these cells. So Schneider's insect media, L15 or DMEM, uh, supplemented with 20% FBS and antibiotics and antifungals. And then again, we patiently wait for the cells to grow and change the media somewhat regularly. Although initially you kind of have to leave them for a while to hope that some of the cells attach. And on the right, you can kind of see one of the preliminary pictures that we've taken. The cells look really funky and um, interesting right now. Let's put it that way. Um, but I looked at them since taking this picture and uh, there's actually quite a few of them that have attached. Um, so hopefully over the next couple weeks or so, we can um, do like a careful um, trypsin split or something to get these, this looks like a clump of cells. So we're hoping to get them apart and get a slightly better um, actual, um, what's it called, cell layer. Um, and we're also trying different methods of how we can, during the process of making the cell lines, how we can break up these clumps, for example, with a trypsin treatment during this um, 
after the centrifugation step too, so that when we put them in the flask, we might already get a better like um, mono layer of cells and not these uh, clumpy cells that attach. But I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can achieve making a new cell line within you know, a year or two. <laughs> Um, and then the last part is developing reliable protocols for infection, gene silencing, gene knockout, and transfection of our existing and new QLX cell lines. So we've obviously only been able to start in the existing cell lines, um, but what we found is um, with these HSU cells, uh, you need a lot of virus to infect them. So for Yusutu virus, which is a flavivirus um, that's um, all over Europe right now, um, you need about an MY of 100. So this means um, technically, there's a hundred virus particles, infectious virus particles per cell that we're adding to these cells to get about, you know, maybe 50% of the cells infected. If you did this in a mammalian or a highly susceptible cell system, you would get um, this amount of infected cells already with an MOI of one or so. So we need a lot more virus to get the cells infected for Yusutu virus. When we looked at lacrosse virus, which is an orthobunia virus, um, we needed about tenfold less virus um, to get the similar, a similar amount of cells infected. So clearly these cells are more susceptible to um, lacrosse encephalitis virus compared to Yusutu virus. And um, we've since made some growth curves. So we now have um, our baseline for how to do experiments uh, using these two arboviruses. We've also tried to infect the cells with Synthus virus, which is an alpha virus. Um, but had no success getting them infected with um, two different strains that we tested here at UNR, and I tried one previously at my old university and couldn't get them infected. So they seem kind of completely resistant to synthesis virus infection. We've also tested different transfection reagents for transfection of this RNA, double stranded RNA, and plasmids. So we've had really good success with the double stranded RNA transfection, actually using most of the reagents we've tried. We see a lot of um, fluorescence when we try the transfection. Um, sRNAs are visually a little bit less um, convincing, but I'll show you the functional knockout in a moment, and it actually works um, really well with this sRNAs as well. So we think that the signal is just less um, strong from a fluorescent sRNA compared to a larger molecule like a fluorescent double stranded RNA. And then we also tested different reagents for the plasma transfection and had really good success with this extreme gene HPDNA from Roche, which gets, you know, in some of these conditions, about 50 to 60% of cells infected. Um, so this, this is kind of our uh, baseline to actually do any experiments with these relatively difficult to work with cells. Um, as I mentioned, we did a sirene emitted gene silencing also um, in these cells using a functional knockout. So you, you're looking at two different uh, mosquito genes, PV4 and Cullen, at 48 hours post-transfection and 72 hours post-transfection with two different transfection reagents as well. And what we generally found is that at 72 hours post-infection, you get a pretty good sort of 90% knockdown of the genes of interest. Um, independent of which transfection reagent we used um, for these. So we were quite happy with that because we've had some struggles with knocking down genes in these cells in the past. And actually, when you look at the double-stranded RNA, which is this figure, uh, you can see double-stranded RNA transfections 48 hours and 72 hours um, later. Uh, and the, we only use PV4 here, but use four different transfection reagents. And you can kind of see that um, there's a much larger error bars, uh, so it's less reliable, the knockdown. Um, but with this reagent RNAi max, um, we're getting kind of pretty good sort of 80% knockdown um, at 72 hours. Um, so because this was one of the really good ones here in this experiment as well, we um, ended up using the RNAi max for any of our subsequent experiments that I'm going to show you later. So in summary for this first part, um, we have established methods to dechlorinate Culex eggs um, using 10% uh, sodium hypochlorite uh, and using air drying, um, which has a higher survival compared to an isopropanol treatment. Um, and next, we'll test various cryoprotectants and snap freezing procedure uh, to see if we can actually get embryos to survive after uh, liquid nitrogen storage. 
Um, we are still waiting for single cell sorted HSU cells to grow. Um, this might be the hardest one to achieve um, just because these cells grow so slowly and they don't like to be kind of individual. Um, so it's possible that we cannot recover them after that sorting process. Um, we'll see. Uh, so we might try this again using slightly different settings on the sorter and maybe slightly different media compositions and things like that. And then uh, we've established that an MOI of 50 is required for use of virus infection of HSU cells, while an MOI of about five is enough for the cross virus infection of HSU cells to get sort of what we call a decent amount of cells infected, um, whether that's 30, 40, 50 percent, but something that we can use in an experiment. And um, we've also established that lipofectum and RNA max transfection reagents works really well with siRNA and double strand RNA to um, knock down uh, gene expression by 72 hours post-transfection. And we'll start trying to generate um, transgenic Culex mosquito cell lines soon, probably starting with the next semester. So now I'll get to the second part of uh, this project, which is to study select antiviral responses. So this gets into a bit more data and not just method establishment. Uh, and this was done um, mostly by, uh, well, myself and uh, my PhD student Elizabeth, a former technician, Lexi, and an undergrad, undergraduate researcher, Transend. So if you're familiar of R with RNA interference, um, then you might have seen some sort of uh, figure of the siRNA pathway before. It's um, fundamentally antiviral in, in all arthropods, as far as I'm aware. Um, so when a a virus infects the cell, and for example, it has a single-stranded RNA genome, it uh, generates a double-stranded RNA replication intermediate. As, so it, if it needs to replicate the single-stranded RNA, it has to make the complementary strand, which results in double-stranded RNA. And this double-stranded RNA is then recognized by the endonuclease DICER2, and DICER2 uh, sort of chops it up into 21 nucleotide siRNAs, and these siRNAs are then used um, by the RNA use silencing complex risk um, to target viral RNA. And the enzyme argonal 2 targets viral RNA and slices it. So it's a very um, sequence specific direct antiviral mechanism to get rid of viral RNA. The other side of this, um, of the RNA interference pathway that people are interested in when they're working on with mosquitoes is the pi RNA pathway. So the pyrene pathway isn't fundamentally an antiviral pathway. It's a, um, a germline protection mechanism from retrotransposon activity. So um, in most organisms, including us as uh, mammals, uh, but also invertebrates, you have these um, pyrene clusters that are a part of the, of the genome of the organism. They're transcribed into precursor pyrenes. And then these pi RNAs are processed by an endonuclease called zucchini into primary pi RNAs that are 20 to, 24 to 30 nucleotide long and predominantly have a uridine at position one. So they're slightly larger than SI RNAs and they have this very specific nucleotide signature of the uridine at position one. So the, this primary pi RNA that can then bind to a transposon and through a peewee protein, this transposon now is cut, um, and this results in the production of a secondary pi RNA, which generally has an adenine of position 10 based on the way the, the peewee protein cuts. And then the secondary pi um, RNA can be used to process more pi RNA precursor, and you get this what's called a pink bone amplification loop, resulting in a lot of primary pi RNAs with this uridine of position 1, and secondary pi RNAs with the adenine of position 10. And this gets rid of um, transposons, which if transposons are kind of um, popping around the genome, they can cause a lot of damage um, in germline cells where you really want to protect the genome. However, in mosquitoes, it's been proposed that um, these pyronase and PV proteins may have an antiviral role. So that's what we're interested in studying in Culex mosquitoes. Uh, I'll briefly show you um, a figure from a paper that looked at virus-derived pyronase also called BPI RNAs in 80s mosquitoes, where they sequenced small RNAs uh, from virus, chikungunya virus infected 80s alpha cells. And then when you, what you can see is that you have this big peak at 21 nucleotides. Those are the SI RNAs that I mentioned before. 
And then you also get a peak at around 27, 28 nucleotides. And those are, um, at least presumably at this point, pi RNAs. Um, and then in, in these other signs, um, C636 cells, they cannot produce as RNAs. So you get a larger peak of, of these pi RNAs. And when you look at the nucleotide sequence of these and analyze them for any bias at a specific position, you can see that uh, the 20 nucleotides actually have no specific strong bias, but the 27 nucleotide um, sequences have a bias for a uridine at position one and an adenine at position 10, kind of reinforcing the idea that these are pi RNAs. And you find them in both of these cell lines. And so it's been a little bit unclear how much of an antiviral role they really have, or if they're just a byproduct um, that happens during virus infection. Um, but it's a, it's a relatively hot topic of research in Aedes mosquitoes. So in, in, Culex, in Culex mosquitoes, um, before we started this project, we only knew that they generate 21 nucleotide um, SI RNAs after infection of Western Island Rift Valley fever. And then we did know that QS quinquefasciatus can generate virus derived pi RNAs after infection with Rift Valley fever virus. We, but the, the abundance was pretty low during infection. And we also know that there are at least six peewee proteins. Um, but what we were interested in, what type of small RNAs are generated upon a virus infection with other viruses that people haven't looked at or people haven't looked at for pi RNAs yet in QX mosquitoes and cells. And then also whether these VPI RNAs and or the peewee proteins play any antiviral role in QX uh, responses. So our experimental design was kind of straightforward. We infected uh, QX quinca fasciatus with West Nile virus, um, isolated RNA from midguts and salivarians at seven days. We also did other time points, but I'm not going to show those. Uh, and then West Nile virus was also used to infect QX cell lines, um, including our HSU cells and RNA was isolated at two and six days post-infection. And then we sequenced the small RNAs from these samples infected with West Nile virus um, on an Illumina sequencer and analyzed them um, with a kind of custom pipeline and um, uh, an R package called Viral. And what we saw is that independent of whether it was QX quinquefasciatus midguts, salivary glands, or our HSU cells, when they were infected with West Nile virus, um, we see a big peak at 21 nucleotides, like we would expect for its RNAs. We saw no obvious peak at any of the larger sizes in any of the tissues or cells. And when we still took the reads that were of that larger length, so 27, 28 nucleotides, um, we saw no bias for any specific position um, of these. So there's no evidence for any virus that have pi RNAs in QX quinquefasciatus midguts, salivary glands, and HSU cells after West Nile virus infection. So it was like, it was a little bit disappointing to have this negative result, but apparently it just doesn't seem to happen um, for West Nile virus. Uh, however, we have this virus called Merida virus uh, that we found to persistently infect HSU cells. So our cell line HSU cells, um, when you stain with double-stranded RNA, you see that there's lots of double stranded RNA in the cells. And this must, I mean, must almost be derived from a virus. So when we sequence the cells, we determined that it's from a raptovirus called Merida virus. Um, we identified the complete genome um, and RNA in both the cell lysid and the supernatant of the cells. And um, raptoviruses have a negative sense RNA genome as opposed to flaviviruses like West Nile, which has a positive sense RNA genome. So when we looked for small RNAs to Merida virus in our samples that we'd already sequenced, we found that they, there was a 21 nucleotide peak, um, but we also saw this peak at 27 nucleotides for small RNAs that bind to the Merida virus genome. And we looked for a nucleotide bias, and we, we saw that there was a strong bias for a uridine shown here as a thymine because it's DNA at position one in the antisense reads and in a sense read we found a uh, strong bias for an adenine position 10. So we were pretty happy because these are virus derived pi RNAs and they give this gives us something that we can work on and study. Um, another sort of side factor here was that the location of these nucleotides 
at these small RNAs was very interesting. All the SI RNAs seem to be clustered here at one end of the genome, and the pi RNAs all seem to cluster at the other end of the genome. But we don't really have a, like an explanation for this yet. The next step we wanted to do is look at whether any of these PV proteins that are supposed to be involved in generating pi RNAs have any antiviral role against Merida virus in HSU cells. So we did a knockdown of, um, of the six different PV proteins that we know in Culex and one of the accessory genes called Zepini. So at the bottom here, you could just see the knockdown efficiency of these genes at 48 hours after transfection. Um, it's uh, pretty decent, not great for some of them, only 50% here for PV3. Um, and then at 96 hours, where some of the genes like PV4, the knockdown has already kind of uh, been gone. So the protein, uh, the gene probably has a high turnover. And um, at the top here, you see our Merida virus RNA levels in these different knockdown conditions. And we were kind of surprised because it looks like every single PeeWee has like a little bit of an impact on the virus, both at 48 hours where it's not really statistically significant yet. But then at um, 96 hours, you can see the error bus getting smaller and the difference getting a little bit more pronounced. Uh, we repeated the experiment at 96 hours and saw basically the same thing. So at this point, it looks as if all PV proteins and accessory genes have a small, potentially a small antiviral role on uh, Merida virus. So in summary of the second part, we did not detect any virus threat pi RNAs from West Nile virus in Culex mosquitoes in vitro or in vivo. Uh, we did detect pi RNAs from the insect-specific raptovirus, Merida virus, and when we knocked down different PV proteins, it resulted in a small increase in Merida virus RNA levels. And uh, the next steps for us are to test if um, VPI RNA production may be specific to negative sense RNA viruses, because the only in Culex mosquitoes, because the only viruses we so far have identified as um, generating pi RNAs in Culex were Merida virus, and in this other paper they showed it for. Um, Rift Valley fever virus, which is also a negative sense virus. Um, and then we want to determine the impact of um, individual PV knockdown on pi RNA production and determine whether PV knockdown impacts other viruses such as U2 virus or lacrosse encephalitis virus. So this brings us to the final part of my talk where I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about this um, screen that we're trying to develop to identify new proviral, antiviral, and viral tolerance genes in Culex quinquefasciatus. And actually, we're doing this in Culex quinquefasciatus and Aedes aegypti in parallel. So some of the data, um, well, the main piece of data I'm going to be showing you is actually from Aedes aegypti so far. Um, we have two grad students working on this, Brian, who's doing the work on Aedes aegypti, and Elizabeth is working on Culex quinquefasciatus, kind of in parallel. So um, Brian has been doing uh, a lot of the cloning that I will be talking about in a moment. So the idea for this high throughput screen is um, if we are knocking down or knocking out specific genes um, that may impact um, virus replication or virus tolerance. There's three different outcomes. So we remove a gene, it might result in increased virus replication, in which case the mosquito might die because uh, once you remove that fine balance between the mosquito and the virus, um, it can be uh, result in a sort of pathogenic infection to the mosquito. The other outcome might be that you have reduced virus replication. So if we um, knock down a proviral gene, it would uh, reduce virus replication, which might mean that the mosquito lives happily ever after, but it doesn't transmit the virus. And then in the third case, you might have a gene where the virus replication itself is actually not impacted at all, but the tolerance to this infection by the mosquito is impacted. So all of these scenarios could potentially um, result in reduced or no virus transmission. So we are interested in looking at things that um, that are antiviral, that are proviral, or that mediate this kind of tolerance to infection. And our immediate aim is just to establish the methodology for this high throughput screen. So we're using 16 selected targets, um, and we will infect cells with uh, a flavivirus, uh, so a Zika virus for Aedes aegypti and Yasutu virus for Culex quinquefasciatus and then determine which of these genes influence virus replication or um, cell survival. 
So we've generated, so I should have mentioned this before maybe, but we're doing this through a CRISPR-Cas9 um, screening method. We're also doing it through a double strand RNA um, transfection and an siRNA transfection, all in parallel to see which one works best. So for our Cas9 system, we uh, made a plasmid that has a metallothionine promoter that can be induced with copper, sulf copper sulfate or cadmium chloride. Um, under this promoter, we'll have expression of a Cas9 that's tagged uh, with an M-cherry. Um, I think actually my students changed this now to a GFP, but uh, either way, we should be able to visualize exp Cas9 expression after induction of um, the promoter using copper or cadmium. And then um, we also have pure mycins for a selection, uh, selection of stably transfected cells. So our workflow will be to transfect cells, select using pure mycin, and then probably do a, a flow cytometry screening here um, after induction of Cas9 to see which cells are um, fluorescent, and then hopefully recover these clonal cell lines and have a stably transfected cell line that can that we can induce Cas9 expression in whenever we want. So the main reason for using the inducible system is just that if we have constitutive Cas9 expression, I would be worried that we would be getting lots of off-target effects just by growing the cells and passaging the cells. So I think in our um, experiment, it would work better if the Cas9 is only expressed right when we need it to be expressed. So my student has cloned this plasmid, and um, this is a figure of him. This is a constitutively expressing plasmid where you just chose that, uh, you know, you have an anti-Cas9 antibody and you show that you can detect Cas9 and it's the same as the M-cherry promoter, uh, like the same cells are uh, green and red. And then at the bottom, he used this uh, metallothionine Cas9 GFP plasmid um, and either treated them with cadmium or didn't treat them with cadmium. And then 24 hours later looked at the cells and you can kind of see that the, the non-treated cells are generally not fluorescent. Um, this There's like maybe a slight GFP signal here, but it's very, very mild. And then when he treated them with cadmium, you can see that um, some of the cells are now expressing um, Cas9. And uh, again, he did the immunostaining for Cas9 and using the reporter, it looks like the immunostaining is slightly more sensitive uh, to pick up the Cas9. So um, we might have to optimize that a bit more. And then the idea is now that we generate these cells that are stably transfected with Cas9. Um, we would then trans induce Cas9 expression using, well, either copper sulfate or cadmium chloride, um, transfect the cells with a guide RNA um, to these 16 genes that we're initially looking at, and then infect them with the flavivirus. Like I said, for Culex, we would use Yusutivirus, and for Aedes, we would use Zika virus, and then look at um, viral RNA and potentially also plaque assays, as well as cell viability to we'll see if virus replication goes up down or we have an impact on um, sort of cell survival after infection. So in summary, we've generated our inducible Cas9 expression plasmid and we're in the process of generating stably transfected cells. So currently my student has cells under pure mycin selection, um, hoping that we can start the sorting this or next week. Um, we've also established the double strand RNA is RNA knockdown conditions, kind of as I've showed you earlier. Um, and my student Elizabeth has made all the double-stranded RNAs for these 16 different genes. So we're really currently just waiting for some RNA extraction reagents that have been back ordered um, to, to perform our double-stranded RNA screen, our SI RNA screen. Um, so those are the ones we later want to compare the Cas9, um, CRISPR-Cas9 knockout screen to. So we'll perform the guide RNA-based uh, Cas9 knockout screening, validate that we actually get reduction in gene expression using that system, and then perform the virus infection. Uh, and then ultimately the plan is to choose whichever of these methods works best. Like of course the Cas9 is like, you know, maybe what sounds like the, the coolest or the newest, but if an siRNA screen works better and is um, more reliable in the data, then we will go ahead with an siRNA screen to move to um, sort of like a near genome wide screen of um, for knockdowns. 
So I'd like to thank everyone in my lab who's contributed to these projects, um, our funding um, from USDA, NIH, um, and um, yeah, my former lab, Red Eagle's lab, and other people that um, were in Red Eagle's lab and helped me get some of this QLEX work started. 